Our story begins along the Tuolumne River. It is a story of great ambitions and hard work that transformed a vast, seasonally dry land into one of the world's most productive landscapes. The land between the Tuolumne and Merced rivers lies in the heart of California's 400-mile-long Central Valley. Before irrigation, life on these sandy plains depended on the seasonal cycles of sun and rain, of cool, moist winters contrasted with hot, dry summers, punctuated by a burst of wildflowers amid the lush green of spring. For centuries, it had been the land of the Yokut, but it was transformed almost overnight by the discovery of gold. 49ers passed through the valley on their way to the mother load. The little settlements along the valley rivers followed. Ranchers began grazing cattle on the grasslands, nearly wild steers that could look out for themselves. In 1867, a rapid transition from grazing to grain farming began south of the Tuolumne. Wheat was California's first great agricultural bonanza. This was large-scale, mechanized farming. In the fall, after the first rains had softened the soil, squadrons of Stockton gang plows and cedars planted the crop, which was ready for harvest by June. The farms covered hundreds, often thousands of acres, and supported only a small and scattered population. It was a world of wheat as far as the eye could see. This was a dry farmed crop. The soil was tilled and the wheat was planted in the fall after the rains had softened the ground. Uh, it just grew over the winter and then was harvested uh, in the early summer and was shipped uh, first by river and then by the railroads all over the world. This was really a, an international export from California. Destined for the grain markets of Europe, wheat was shipped to San Francisco by river boats until the railroad arrived in 1871. Turlock was founded in that year by John Mitchell, the owner of 100,000 acres stretching from Keys to Atwater. The virgin soil of the valley was rich, but the success of each season's crop depended on having enough rain. Dry years brought the threat of crop failure and calamity. It was no wonder that when drought struck, farmers' thoughts turned to irrigation. Well, originally, irrigation was discussed in uh, the Turlock area just about every time there was a drought. Somebody would say, wouldn't it be good if we could irrigate? Irrigating the wheat, of course, was probably not the highest use for the water. And it was, it was not really anything that took a hold. Because of the cost, there'd be a slight enthusiasm, then it would go away. The history of irrigation on the plains south of the Tuolumne began long before the wheat era with Silas Wilcox, surveyor for the newly formed Stanislaus County. In his November 1854 report to the Surveyor General of California, he wrote, The plains of this country could be irrigated by taking the water from the rivers running through it at the foot of the mountains by means of canals. It is not expedient at present, for it would be attended with great expense and have but few consumers. 
Wilcox's vision was remarkable because irrigation, which had been practiced in the Southwest for centuries, was new to Americans used to the well-watered lands of the Eastern states. The first effort to turn that vision into reality came in the same year that welcomed the railroad and the new town of Turlock. Eighteen seventy one found the area suffering from an extended drought. A group of investors formed the Tuolumne Water Company and offered to sell water from private irrigation canals. But the price was more than the farmers could afford. Undaunted, the company built a sturdy timber dam 30 feet high near LaGrange. As the first step in an irrigation system, it was confident would one day prove profitable. The 1870s saw several more attempts to bring water to the plains, but a lack of funding put a quick end to all of them. Despite those failures, the idea of irrigation had begun to take root. In 1885, the first sign of renewed interest in irrigation south of the river came in the form of an open meeting that was attended by about 40 people, and they wasted no time in beginning work. A surveyor was hired to lay out canals from the Tuolumne or from the Merced River, but once again, the project quickly collapsed. Irrigation supporters ordered new surveys in 1886, and by that time, things had changed. A new, more expansive vision of irrigation was sweeping Stanislaus County. As a letter to the Modesto Daily Evening News put it, A canal means smaller farms, a varied production, an increased population, and more customers for the storekeeper, blacksmith, hotel keeper, the livery man, the professional man. In fact, it means prosperity for everybody dependent upon public patronage. Irrigation was now about more than just bringing water to a parched land. It was about building a different kind of community, one that would replace the monotonous landscape of wheat with new crops, family farms, and prosperous towns. And because irrigation would bring such broad public benefits, it seemed reasonable to make it a public project. In the midst of the new irrigation crusade, a young attorney from Modesto named C.C. Wright ran for the state assembly in 1886 with the express purpose of pushing legislation for the local public control of irrigation. Winning a resounding victory, Wright began putting his ideas into writing. He proposed the creation of a new kind of local government, an irrigation district. Wright later explained the rationale behind his bill. In devising plans, it occurred to me that the best method whereby the people could organize, and when organized, would have the power to assess and collect money for the purpose of constructing works by the ordinary process of levy and collection was the proper thing and that a local government based on the familiar lines of county government and officers, differing in no respect except in the object to be obtained, would accomplish our purpose without chance of failure. It was the charter for an irrigation community in which all voters, not just landowners or irrigators, would have a voice and in which all would have a financial stake. His bill won easy passage, and when the governor signed it in March of 1887, the assembly erupted in applause. Reaction was equally enthusiastic at home, and petitions were quickly circulated to form an irrigation district south of the Tuolumne. The proposal went to the voters on May 28th, and on June 6th, 1887, 
the Turlock Irrigation District became the first district born under the Wright Act. By early 1890, excavation finally began in the foothills near LaGrange, but a dam was still needed to divert water from the river into the canal. In the 1870s, M.A. Wheaton, a San Francisco attorney, had acquired all the assets of the old Tuolumne Water Company, and with it, the timber dam at LaGrange. Although his dam occupied the best site for a diversion structure, Wheaton put such a high price on his property that the district decided to build its dam at another place just upstream. Having failed to make a deal with TID, Wheaton sold his dam to the Modesto Irrigation District, which had been formed on the north side of the river just a month after the Turlock District. Talks between the two irrigation districts and Wheaton culminated in an agreement to buy out all of Wheaton's interests on the river and build a joint dam at the site to serve both districts. The Grange Dam itself uh, is a simple overpour dam. Its only purpose is just to raise the level of the river high enough to enter the canals at a level which will allow them to enter the districts uh, at the edge of the foothills for irrigation. You needed to raise the water from the bed of the river uh, over 125 feet. So the Grange Dam is a 127 foot dam. It's built out of rubble masonry. It's just boulders. Uh, quarried in the canyon, dressed uh, with, with rough stones, it's all set in concrete. In fact, the only thing the districts had to haul into the, the area to build the dam was the cement. Everything else was mined there on the site. Uh, construction started about 1891. It was completed at the end of 1893. Uh, at the time it was constructed, it was the highest overpour dam in the world. The August 9, 1890 agreement was about more than the construction of a dam. The Turlock and Modesto districts also agreed to divide the water diverted by the dam in proportion to their respective acreages and to share any future projects on the river on the same basis. It was a permanent partnership for the development of the Tuolumne River. anti-irrigationists, uh, the people who were opposed to the operation of the district, I became more serious as the 1890s went on. There was a major depression, the Panic of 1893, ushered in a national depression. And at that time, as, as uh, you know, crops were already failing, the wheat price went down, uh, the, the whole idea of paying for this irrigation district, you know, became more problematic. There were uh, arguments in other parts of the state over irrigation. So the anti-irrigationists started filing suits uh, against the district's collection of taxes uh, in the 1890s. And they were sometimes joined in those suits even by friends of the district who frankly just couldn't pay their taxes because of the terrible economic times. It was a difficult time, and irrigation district bonds would sell only at a deep discount, sometimes only 50% of their face value when they could be sold at all. Under those circumstances, work on the canal stopped again. Overwhelmed by hard times, the district became virtually bankrupt. But one man, a retired judge from Oakland named James A. Waymeyer, kept that from happening. Waymeyer believed in the vision of harnessing water to transform the land and was an early investor in the district's bonds. He was so confident that the district would ultimately prosper that he offered to complete the canals in exchange for the construction bonds that other investors were rejecting. And Waymeyer struggled to keep that work going through the 1890s. Sometimes he only had a few men working, sometimes he got a big crew going. He finally ran out of money 
just as the canals were being finished, just as the, it got the main canal finished down to Hickman. They were building the main canals and laterals uh, through the district. He ran out of money, the district got other contractors to finish up. Waymeyer's plan was to make a fortune in irrigation bonds. He bought up some bonds and tried to sell them in New York and San Francisco, but he had no buyers. So he had to put more of his money into, into the bonds. And he basically bet the ranch, and he lost. The mortgage company evicted him from his house and piled his furniture on the lawn. But without Waymeyer, the district would never have built the canal system. By October 1898, the main canal had finally reached the edge of the plains near the town of Hickman. When the canal system reached Hickman, again, there was a delay. Men walked off the job. They weren't getting paid. So Horace Crane came in with, with the help of others, of course, and also with Lou, Lewis Hickman. And they brought out all their own equipment and used their own horses, scraping equipment, and dug these canals. 1899, water reached Hickman. It got to Denier. Horace and the others went ahead and, and ran the ditches into Turlock. They went over to Ceres, and a man by the name, I think, of Stirring got the first water. A year and a half later, as a new century dawned, the long-awaited water arrived in the Turlock Irrigation District. There was indeed cause for celebration in March of 1900, as the first water from the Tuolumne River was released into the Ceres Main Canal. The Stanislaus County Weekly News reported, The water of the Turlock Canal is now being used on a piece of land one mile north of Ceres. Henry Stirring having taken it out of lateral zero to irrigate a piece of land for corn. He had quite a large head running on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of last week. Many Modestoans had driven out to see the site. Mr. Stirring is entitled to what honor there is in being the first to use the Turlock water. The irrigation age had arrived. Mr. Stirring was one of the first newcomers attracted to the area by the promise of water, and thousands of others soon followed. It wasn't long before water was flowing into Turlock, and one of those first farmers to receive water was Henry Gear. And Henry Gear planted approximately 20 acres of alfalfa. My cousin Abner, uh, right across the road from here, had an apricot orchard, and he was irrigating his, his apricots. And he had the water in a check, and he wanted to, to get a little sleep and still be able to turn his water off. So what he did, he laid down right in the check where the water would hit him and wake him up. Well, the water hit him all right, but it didn't wake him up. And it ran right over him until it ran into his nose. And then there he woke up before he drowned. The water was here now. The, the challenge was to go ahead and try to get settlers here to look to see what the potential was and to sell it, which that was a whole other ball game. The worn out grain ranches were broken up into 10, 20, and 40 acre parcels. One real estate promoter claimed that the Turlock area offered the cheapest good land and the best cheap land in California. The landscape that greeted the settlers when they arrived by train in Turlock was what we would probably refer to as bleak. I mean, these were worn out grain fields. Uh, they were, uh, in the summer it was hot, uh, dry stubble. After people started cultivating the soil, uh, as the farmers did who first arrived for irrigation, uh, that loose soil blew in huge clouds of dust, sandstorms. Uh, there are stories of, of real estate agents taking people out to show them this wonderful property and being lost in sandstorms. And that's probably not the best advertisement you're going to find. It was a dry place. 
except for these irrigated farms. And as you got more irrigated farms, it became easier to promote the land because you had an example of what an alfalfa field would look like, what a new peach orchard would look like, uh, what a vineyard would look like. In just the first 10 years of irrigation, the number of taxpayers in the district rose from only 313 to more than 2,000. Farm by farm, the landscape around Turlock was transformed into bright green fields of alfalfa, interspersed with beans and corn and peach and apricot orchards. Coming from the colder part of Minnesota, they found out you could raise all kinds of fruits, so he put every kind of fruit tree on the place that he could think of. So we had nuts and figs and apricots and peaches and not many apples. We did have some apples. A quince tree and chestnuts, almonds and walnuts, everything. And I think they just did all this because they had never had that opportunity in the Midwest. One of the reasons this is a good area, the Turlock area, the Turlock Irrigation District, is there's a lot of good farmland to raise the crops for the cattle. The water situation, it's probably the best in the state. Sweet potatoes were a success, and melons, cantaloupes, watermelons, cassavas, and honeydews became such a successful crop that some farms were paid off in a single harvest. With the influx of settlers, the towns came alive, and new communities like Hillmar, Houston, and Denair were founded. The irrigation dream was becoming a reality. As the Tuolumne flows down from its Sierra Nevada headwaters, it passes the sheer granite walls of Hetch Hetchy Valley. It was a place that invited comparison with Yosemite Valley. But in 1901, the city of San Francisco announced plans to turn it into a reservoir and use the Tuolumne as a municipal water supply. In the Turlock and Modesto districts, where irrigation was just beginning. The threat of competition for the water they depended on sparked immediate opposition. As one local resident said, God gave to San Francisco the Pacific Ocean, the rest of the world to the Standard Oil Company, but the waters of the Tuolumne River belong to Stanislaus County. Hetch Hetchy was within the boundaries of Yosemite National Park. After its application for a construction permit was twice rejected by the Secretary of the Interior, the city won permission in 1908 to build its project. In an effort to protect the irrigation districts, the permit prohibited the city from interfering in the slightest particular with their prior rights to the Tuolumne. Despite that approval, the project continued to be the center of national debate. John Muir led a fight to preserve the scenic valley that became a landmark in American environmental history. Dam Hetch Hetchy, he thundered. As well dam for water tanks, the people's cathedrals and churches. By 1912, the city had significantly increased the scope of its plans in the amount of water it wanted to use. In response, the districts stepped up their opposition. We strenuously oppose any further grant to any of the waters upon the Tuolumne River to San Francisco or its neighboring cities and believe there is not a sufficient supply of water to irrigate the lands that can be irrigated from the Tuolumne River in the San Joaquin Valley. The amount of water to be used beneficially when all the land is under irrigation will take practically all of the water both normal, flood, and storm that can be conserved for the purpose of both of these districts. With a bill pending in Congress to authorize the city to construct the Hetch Hetchy project, a delegation from Turlock and Modesto was sent to Washington to stop it. 
Finding that support had swung to the city, they made the best deal they could, preserving and even expanding the protection of their rights. Controversial to the end, the Raker Act, passed in 1913, redefined the future of the Tuolumne River. Fed by melting snow from the mountains, water thundered over LaGrange Dam each spring. But by midsummer, the river had slowed to a trickle, too little to support the expanded acreage of irrigated crops. The district soon realized that they needed to store some of the high flow to carry them through the hot, dry months of summer. After investigating sites in the High Sierras, it became evident that the cheapest and quickest place for the Torlake district to build a reservoir would be where the main canal passed through a little basin about halfway between LaGrange and Hickman on the Alfred Davis Ranch. The reservoir, which is now known as Turlock Lake, was filled for the first time in June of 1914 when a wall near the outlet gate suddenly collapsed, sending a torrent of water down the canal until it cut through the bank and slipped back into the Tuolumne. Despite the frantic efforts to replace the damaged canal section, the irrigation season was lost. Perhaps the only good that was to come out of 1914 was the appointment of Roy V. Meikle as the district's chief engineer. It was a position that he would hold for the next 57 years. A native of Ohio, Meikle attended Stanford University, leaving the school before completing the engineering program. I couldn't wait another year for a degree, he said later. The world needed engineers. He came to Turlock in 1912 to help prepare the district's defense against San Francisco. In the summer of 1913, while the Raker Act was being debated in Washington, Meikle and a party of eight men surveyed a reservoir site just a few miles from LaGrange. By the end of the year, the district had taken the first steps towards the construction of Don Pedro Dam. Gold seekers arrived in the oak and grass-covered hills along the Tuolumne in 1848. It is said that a Frenchman named Pierre Saint-Sevier, known to his Spanish-speaking friends as Don Pedro, left the remote canyon with a fortune in the precious metal. Don Pedro's bar was one of the richest of the Tuolumne River mining camps, and in its brief heyday boasted two hotels and a notorious Fandango hall. By the 1860s, the gold had run out and the town was abandoned. After drawing up the initial plans for the Don Pedro Dam, TID acquired land in the reservoir area. And in 1919, the Turlock and Modesto districts signed an agreement for a joint construction and operation of the project. Turlock's share, based on the acreage in the two districts, was fixed at 68.46%. Faced with bids that were higher than expected, the districts decided to build the dam themselves, with Meikle as chief engineer of the construction project. They built a railroad branch to the site and set up a camp on the hills above the river to house the hundreds of workers that would be needed. It was a small city with bunkhouses for the bachelors, tents for the married men, a 10-bed hospital, a 400-seat mess hall, and a recreational hall. Ground was officially broken on June 25, 1921. Two mammoth cement mixers began to make more than a thousand cubic yards of concrete a day. 
the district's boards ordered their engineers to proceed on their own to construct the dam. And that's an amazing thing. Usually you use a construction uh, company, a big contractor, to come in and organize all the people and, and uh, the supplies and so forth that it takes to build a big project. But the districts did it all themselves, with Meikle as the chief engineer, not only of Turlock Irrigation District, but of the dam construction project, which was done on time and within budget and was completed in 1923. So you have this remarkable situation where districts that had only been delivering water for around 20 years built the tallest dam in the world by themselves without a contractor, on, you know, on their own totally, on time and on budget. It was really remarkable. At 284 feet, it was the highest dam in the world, and the two irrigation districts had financed and built it themselves, on time and on budget. And it had a powerhouse that put TID in the electric business. the 1920s. It was not only the jazz age, it was the electric age. From radios to refrigerators, Americans were plugging into a growing number of conveniences. As it contemplated the electric future made possible by Don Pedro, the Turlock Irrigation District had two choices. It could wholesale its power to a private utility, or it could string its own wires and distribute electricity directly to district residents. To evaluate those options, it hired electrical engineer R.W. Shoemaker, who concluded that in the long run, the best opportunities were in local distribution. His report stated, The greatest opening for power in the district is the development of the power requirements of the individual householder. As the district will be able to furnish power at a very small cost, it is believed that a large load can be developed from the sale of power for lighting, cooking, and water heating, in addition to small blocks of power that will be used around the farms for miscellaneous purposes. The concept of an irrigation district becoming an electric utility was revolutionary. An advisory election in 1922 proved it was also very popular, with distribution winning over 95% of the votes. As with Don Pedro, the district built its own power lines. On Easter Sunday, 1923, the first electric power from Don Pedro reached the substation near the corner of Gear and Mata Vista Roads, and within a few weeks, TID became the first California irrigation district to sell its own power to retail consumers. A year and a half later, the district had over 3,000 customers and more than 250 miles of lines. The district's lines were especially welcome in rural areas where private power companies had been reluctant to provide service. Electric pumps replaced windmills and kerosene lamps became a thing of the past. There was a real value in the fairs, the Stanislaus County Fair, particularly the Turlock Melon Carnival, because that was the one time the family took what you want to call a vacation. They would work their schedule around going to the Melon Carnival, and Turlock Irrigation District would have an exhi exhibit in the pavilion tent and there would be these electric ranges, refrigerators, the first refrigerators. And so the housewives got a chance to take a look at those things and think, my life would be made a lot easier if I could get one of those. We got an ice box and filled that with ice. And that 
went on for quite a few years. Then there was this possibility of getting refrigerators and you could have your choice of them. And we went out to the TID where we could see all the uh, different ones that they had to offer. We bought our first one at, at the TID and it was a good one. As I remember, some of those lasted a long time. Even with the rapid growth of the distribution system, Don Pedro generated far more power than district residents needed. Fortunately, TID was able to sell this surplus to the San Joaquin Light and Power Company and its successor, Pacific Gas and Electric, under a 30-year contract. Electrical revenues helped the district survive the Great Depression. The tax rate was steadily reduced to help farmers hard-pressed by plummeting crop prices, but still hundreds lost their land and livelihoods. Beginning in 1933, the district's financial stability allowed it to partner with state and federal public works programs to put unemployed men to work on canal lining. All our land is under pipeline irrigation today, and that happened probably in the last 50 years where uh, the pipeline's pretty much taken over the whole area in irrigation. So it's made irrigation for the whole area so much easier. You can irrigate a 40-acre field with very little very little labor and uh, and so that that made it that was a great change in uh, in farming at a time when most California irrigation districts were bankrupt or close to it the Turlock irrigation district thanks to Don Pedro and its successful electric business ended its first 50 years with a celebration it had fulfilled its founder's dreams. Since the passage of the Raker Act in 1913, the Turlock and Modesto irrigation districts knew they would have to share the Tuolumne River with San Francisco. In the early 1930s, as the city was on the verge of delivering water from Hetch Hetchy to the Bay Area, a long simmering dispute over water rights came to a head. In an effort to avoid litigation, the two sides opened negotiations that culminated in a 1940 agreement to abide by the priorities established by the Raker Act and to cooperate on the future development of the Tuolumne River. Since the districts held the first rights to the river, San Francisco depended heavily on stored water to carry it through dry periods, and it needed to build more storage to meet its expanding demand. TID Chief Engineer Meikle and engineers for the city worked out a mutually beneficial solution that they unveiled in 1943. San Francisco would construct a reservoir on Cherry Creek in the upper watershed and would help the districts build a new and much larger Don Pedro. New Don Pedro would be owned and operated by the two irrigation districts but San Francisco agreed to pay a large part of the cost in exchange for the right to use part of the reservoir to bank water needed to meet its legal obligation to protect the district's prior rights. The Army Corps of Engineers also contributed to the project, paying for the storage capacity that would be used for flood control. By 1960, design work was nearing completion for the dam that would rise just a short distance downstream from the original Don Pedro, which would be inundated by the new project. 
The new Don Pedro was designed as an earth and rock-filled dam, a man-made mountain 580 feet high and a half mile thick at its base. All of the 16 million cubic yards of clay and rock were hauled to the dam site by specially designed bottom dump trucks weighing in at 200 tons when fully loaded. The last truckload arrived to top off the dam in May 1970, with Meikle riding in the cab. Now in his 80s, Meikle had remained the district's chief engineer throughout the planning and construction of the new Don Pedro project. He maintained a full schedule, insisting that he should put in a day's work for a day's pay. On November 2nd, 1970, a crowd of more than a thousand people gathered on top of the old dam to watch the final opening of its valves and the transfer of storage to New Don Pedro. No one had played a larger role in the creation of the new Don Pedro than Roy Meikle. But the chief engineer was absent from the celebration that day. He chose not to see the final hours of the dam he had built and operated for nearly half a century. Meikle would retire the next year, an event that, like new Don Pedro, marked the passing of an era. The new reservoir had a capacity of 2,030,000 acre-feet, seven times the size of the old reservoir, and it could generate five times more power. One of the challenges of the new era was maintaining the Tuolumne River salmon run. Chinook salmon, the iconic native fish of Central Valley rivers, arrive in the Tuolumne each fall, spawning in the gravel riffles below LaGrange Dam. Carried by spring runoff, newly hatched young make their way to the sea, returning to the river two or three years later to begin the cycle again. The district's federal hydroelectric license for New Don Pedro required the release of water into the river to support the fishery. The number of fish fluctuated over the years, from thousands down to a few hundred. However, by 1985, concerns over population trends prompted calls for larger releases to improve salmon survival. A negotiated settlement in 1995 significantly increased the amount of water dedicated to environmental purposes. The districts had hired fishery biologists to study the river, and they'd concluded uh, that the, while they didn't need more water for the fish, uh, they didn't need quite as much as the Department of Fish and Game wanted, but there were a number of other ways to deal with it, and that there were a number of other problems that needed to be addressed. Those included uh, predators, uh, non-native fish, black bass, uh, primarily in the Tuolumne that ate the young salmon on their way out to, to sea. Uh, the delta pumps of the great state and federal water projects were sucking up little fish out of the delta, uh, also damaging the spawning run. The Turlock and Modesto irrigation districts participated in a habitat research program in an effort to protect the river. The districts have also undertaken the challenge to balance the needs of the environment with the irrigation water supply that their customers depend on. This balance is hardest in dry years, when there is not enough water. When that happens, 
the district reduces irrigation deliveries to conserve water and turn to groundwater pumping to keep crops from drying up. The groundwater basin, the unseen reservoir beneath the district, is a vital part of the Turlock region's water supply, providing drinking water to local communities and irrigation to land outside district boundaries. Like the river, it has to be carefully managed and conserved for future generations. High water can bring a different kind of problem. The flood control reservation in New Don Pedro cushions the impact of storm runoff. But in 1997, record inflows forced the district to open the massive spillway gates for the first time, sending a major flood down the Tuolumne River. It was stormy night and, and uh, very busy, hectic. And once we witnessed that the water was getting, you know, close to the surface and stuff, it just, you had a nervousness, you know, wondering what it was really going to be like when you start opening. And it was kind of eerie because you knew you were creating a lot of damage downstream and not knowing what it was, it was pitch dark. Uh, so we couldn't see anything, but we could just see the water flipping over the structure and watching it go through. On December 26th, I got a phone call that said that there was going to be a four inch rainstorm on Saturday and four inch rainstorm on Sunday, that the snowmelt elevation was on the order of 9,000 feet. So now instead of a very small percentage of the watershed having rainfall on it, a majority of the watershed had rain on it. So you had rain on snow, and then in addition, you had the warm wind, uh, which is the big snowmelt factor taking place. And so that was, not only did you have the rainfall coming down, but you had the melting of the snow from the previous storms taking place. As big as it is, New Don Pedro could not entirely tame the river. As the district's population continued to grow, so did the demand for electricity. By the 1950s, it had outgrown Old Don Pedro and started purchasing additional power from Hetch Hetchy and Pacific Gas and Electric. While New Don Pedro improved the situation, TID was still dependent on outside energy suppliers. The Arab oil embargo in the early 1970s touched off a nationwide energy crisis and sent the cost of the district's power purchases soaring. The district began a search for more affordable sources of power. It built several power plants, known as mini hydros, to harness the energy potential of falling water in canals, and later added a fourth generating unit at the Don Pedro Powerhouse. In the late 1990s, California embarked on a far-reaching experiment in electric industry deregulation, an experiment that collapsed in 2001 amid rolling blackouts and the bankruptcy of the state's largest private utility. Because it maintained its traditional independence, the Turlock Irrigation District and its customers emerged unscathed from the turmoil that engulfed the electric industry. In the aftermath of the failed attempt at deregulation, the district moved to protect itself from unpredictable energy markets and to assure local management of its energy resources by establishing an independent power control area. In doing so, TID became one of only a handful of utilities capable of maintaining system reliability without relying on outside assistance. In 2006, the district nearly doubled its internal generating capacity when it opened the 250 megawatt Walnut Energy Center. The gas-fired power plant improved control area operation and reduced the district's reliance on outside power. At the dawn of the 21st century, California was also creating a clean energy future in response to legislation, TID adopted a renewable portfolio standard that committed the district to getting at least 20% of its energy from renewable sources by 2017. 
Building on its long history of owning its generation assets, the district exceeded its renewable energy goal in 2008 when it purchased 62 state-of-the-art wind turbines setting along the ridge overlooking the Columbia River in Klickitat County, Washington. Named the Tuolumne Wind Project, it is located in one of the most productive wind regions in the western United States. One hundred ten years after the first irrigation, TID provides water to almost 150,000 acres of farmland, and it supplies electricity to nearly 100,000 residential, farm, business, industrial, and municipal accounts in an electric service area covering more than 662 square miles in the heart of California. We had the perfect team. We had C.C. Wright, whose sole purpose it was, is to form the irrigation district. We had Judge Waymeyer, who spent his personal fortune for us to build a canal system. And then we had Roy Meikle. I think if these men were alive today, they'd be very proud of what they created. The reason for a lot of dairies in this area is they could come up here, do some farming along with dairy, and that works real well. When you can make a lot of your feed or all your feed for the dairy, you get paid off not only in milk, but and product that you raise, that you put through your cows. My mother came in 1908, and she came in July. She couldn't understand how people got along. She walked along, and her shoes were full of sand. She got to stop every so often and empty your shoes of the sand. <laughs> when I was first married, and I was still I was still irrigating with a horse. I'd come home and get something to eat and a cup of coffee, and I can remember sitting there and holding my head and thinking, what the heck am I getting into here? What kind of a life is this? But I kept doing it, and things did get better. Of course, we got more cement ditches and pipelines and leveler ground and that Portuguese farmer that took in his load of watermelons to be shipped out of Turlock, that was the start of all these other farmers that did the same thing. They ended up being shipped around the world. They ended up being shipped to the President of the United States. They ended up being shipped to the King and Queen of England. If we look back at our history, our produce has ended up all over the world, and it, and it ends up all over the world today. Colonists from around the country, even from around the world, came to this area. They had very little education and very little money. They basically came from areas that offered them no hope to prosper. What irrigation offered them was a chance to change their destiny forever.
all began with a dream, a vision of irrigation. It became a story of perseverance and overcoming obstacles. And ultimately, the dream became a reality. But the work and the story of the Turlock Irrigation District continues.